this Wednesday, but I'll be working all the other Wednesdays up through VBS to get everything ready for the rooms. And then elders meet tomorrow at 6. All right? What are your prayer requests today? Anybody? I, I have a prayer request. So we could just stop by on Friday and drop off a new post support at RAE and Foyer. And there's a little boy in the middle who says, please pray for him because he's way out in the mountains that there's no medical or any way to get, you know, medical assistance for him. So. Did she say what his name was? about in Pato. and in the middle of it there's a picture of a boy and that's the boy we're talking about that needs prayer all right okay what else <coughs> mr john both overseas and uh, serving our country. Ma? And for us traveling this weekend. Yeah, well, we're going up to Phoenix. My son's coming in, so we're going to spend some time up there. Mr. Larry? Kathy, she's a little under the weather. What's the latest on your test results? It's going to be a couple of weeks before okay. I hear anything. All right. Kathy, not feeling well. Others? Renee. Huh? Renee. Yeah, Renee. Still under the weather. That was a real good turnout for Sally's uh, pop up. Thank you, ladies, for all that hard work. We're going to wear up as we're running before we get done. <laughs> all right, what else? Yes, Sally. Obviously, like, I just graduated, a bunch of my friends just graduated, so we're now all over the country, and I have friends at internships and trying to figure out life, and so just for all of them, they're traveling, and some of them are getting married, so just for everything that comes after graduation for all of us. Amen. Some are getting married. <laughs> <laughs> you should have seen your look on your father's face when you said that. <laughs> some are getting married. What are you talking about? Where, and what are you going to be doing this summer, Sally? Tell everybody. So I have an internship in Fredericksburg, Virginia, uh, at a church called Spotswood Baptist Church. I'll be working in their student ministry, middle school and high school, specifically with their girls. Yeah. So I'm excited. Amen. The girls are fortunate. Joyce? We have one of those graduates in our grandkids from college, and uh, she's moving to Los Angeles to work in the movie industry. Oh, and baby. Her family's from Illinois, so this is going over. <coughs> and so they'll be on the road June 1st. Moving around there. So Los it's going to be an interesting. Los Angeles. <coughs> Hollywood. Hollywood. Yeah. Hollywood. Yeah. She um. went to a Christian film school for her last semester, which sounds like an oxymoron, but. Uh, Loved it and well, you know, there's probably more Christian movies being produced now. right now than there has been any time in our recent history. Stephen Curry, who plays for the Golden State Warriors, has a new Christian movie coming out. So there's there's some opportunities, but it's a tough environment. Yes, Mr. Don. I just want to thank the Lord and pray that we would just so thankful to be here and to support the Lord for a great church family. It makes a difference in the walk of Jesus. Mm -hmm. You can't go it alone, but I've, I've, I've tried that route before. And you think you think you can do it, you read your Bible and get a lot of you know help from friends and brothers. But the, uh, there's just something to be said about worshiping and just telling the Lord. I want to thank you all for the love in this place. That's all for first half.
understand it. That's Brother Ronnie to lead us in our opening prayer this evening. Father, thank you for this evening. And thank you that we have the freedom and opportunity to be in your house. Pray that you bless the Lord this evening, the Lord, and come our hearts and quiet us. Each of us is prayers to request from you. We pray for Cheryl and David and their children that can't be with us. We pray for protection for them, for protection for Cheryl and David's family. We pray for Lloyd and for his wife, Lloyd. And pray for Renee. We pray for healing there, Lord. was a 
very important city politically. It was a, what you might call a provincial capital. It was to Greece. Corinth was, more, at this time in the history of Greece, Corinth was more important than Athens. Corinth was like Washington, D.C. Are we working? Okay. Corinth was like Washington, D.C. In a sense, it was, uh, it was very, that's where the proconsul of Rome would have lived. Not in Athens, but in the city of Corinth. So that's where the Roman headquarters are. And if you remember, if you wanted to describe somebody, if you wanted to degrade somebody, if you were, if you were really upset with somebody, if you really wanted to let them know, if you wanted to give them a low blow, the lowest blow you could deliver, you would tell them, you live like a Corinthian. And that would be uh, an absolute uh, defilement to speak to, of somebody that way. So, and if, and if you want a, a, an idea of how the Corinthians live, all you have to do is look at 1st and 2nd Corinthians, and you can see how the, what I'll call the crud of Corinth, seeped into the church there. You know, to show you how bad the city was, there were members of the church, certain Christian members of the church who celebrated the fact that they were having relations with their parents. Okay? So that, that gives you an idea what was happening on the outside of the church. And when the church gets, gets that kind of stuff into it, you can imagine must, what must be going on around the church. William Ramsey, Ramsey the commentarian, said, characteristically, Churches take the characteristics of the environment in which they exist culture, culturally. And that's, that's very true to a great extent. Look at today's culture. That culture is expressed in today's church. And the, the Corinthian church had a really rough time uh, keeping the Corinthian world out of the church, Keep it from, keeping from, uh, it from leaking in. So Paul ended up, you know, we're having to write two letters to that church and telling them over and over. The first Corinthians is a very, very critical letter of the church at Corinth. Very, very uh, condemning in many ways. So he had to keep writing them and telling them to shape up and purify themselves and cleanse themselves and tell them they shouldn't act like that because you've been washed and you're clean, uh, cut it out, and so on and so forth. So Paul comes, having left out Athens, and God's going to choose out some believers for him. And if I could give you a, a vivid meta metaphor, it would be like Paul's going to look for some jewels in the sewer. Okay? That's pretty vivid, right? And that's exactly what evangelism in Corinth was like. And Paul's going to go there to try to find these individuals, these jewels. And if you look uh, at verse 10 in Acts 18, the end of verse 10 says, the Lord is speaking to Paul, and what does he say? Even though this is Corinth, the Lord says, I have many people in this city. I have many jewels hidden in the cesspool or the sewer of the city, and Paul, you're the man that's going to pull them out for me. And what God's speaking about is his elect, those that have been sovereignly chosen, those that were in the city, these people he's speaking of right here probably have not been saved yet. But we're, what they're about to come, Paul's about to bring the gospel to the city, and the Lord has prepared their hearts. They have seeking hearts, ready hearts, in the midst of all the, the filth of corn. And Paul's going to reach them with the gospel. And it's exciting to realize, you know, it was very hard for Paul to generate converts when he was in Athens. That's because it's often very hard to do very much with intellectuals. But God, you, you see in God's word reflected, God seems to be much easier for just plain old rotten sinners to accept. Intellectuals have problems with accepting Christ. But to everyday people don't. So Paul didn't stay long in Corinth. Uh, in Athens, he ends up staying very long in Corinth, and Corinth eventually becomes almost like a base of operations for the gospel. It was from the 
city of Corinth that Paul wrote 1st and 2nd Thessalonians. It was from the city of Corinth that Paul also wrote his letter to the church in Rome. It was back to Corinth, of course, that he wrote 1st and 2nd Corinthians. So the church in Corinth became a very important base of operations for the first century New Testament church. Now when Paul arrives there, I, I believe that he was, in your outline, the word is really discouraged. He was at a point where he was weary. I mean, let's look at what's been going on. He's been chased halfway around the world. Just about everywhere he goes, people are hating him. People are hassling him. He's probably frustrated. And he arrives at the next city, and he, what does he see? He sees a, a temple devoted to prostitution. It's the worst thing he's probably seen yet. So I think he was discouraged. But the thing about God is, this is a, something you need to hang on to. When you're discouraged, God is a God of encouragement. I'm not going to take you through the Psalms tonight and show you all the places where the Psalms reflect on God as a God of, and you outline the word as encouragement, but the Psalms are full of that uh, idea. How many times you, you could study the New Testament over and over, and you keep seeing Jesus says, be of good cheer. John 16, 33, Jesus says, in this world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. So God is always, throughout all of his divine revelation, concerned for the encouragement of his own people. So if you find yourself in a discouraging <coughs> position, all you need to do, really, is open up the word of God Amen. and let him speak to you and encourage you. If you believe Philippians 4, Philippians 4 speaks to the idea, my God, God shall supply what? All your needs. We were, we studied that not long ago in regards to anxiety. If a believer needs to be encouraged, what will God do? If you need to be encouraged and God supplies all your needs, that means God will supply you with encouragement. You know, there's, I don't think I can say that there's ever been a long time in my life, a long period of time, where I have not been, at least at some time, discouraged. I get discouraged all the time. Discouragement is just a part of life. It's, sometimes it's a part of ministry because you have hopes and you have dreams and you have desires for people's lives. And sometimes those things just don't work out. And maybe you spend, you spend some of yourself and maybe someone... Someone, there may be people that have hearts that are critical or unjust, uh, that impinge upon your, your motives or whatever, and maybe you're discouraged with your life. And maybe things aren't working out the way you think they should work out. And we all live with that. But God, rest assured, is a God of encouragement. And here's Paul. I think he's near the bottom here. He's discouraged. He's discouraged when he gets to Athens. And I don't think it gets any better. And God's going to come in, and these first 18 verses of uh, this chapter in Acts are, are verses about encouragement. And I, I know I can relate to that, and I pray, I pray to God that you can relate to that too. And we're going to find out that Paul is going to be encouraged here in four different ways. Four <coughs> things that God will encourage Paul with. Number one, he will encourage him with companionship. Friends. Number two, he, he's going to bring some friends into his life. Are friends an encouragement? Yes, they are. Good friends are an encouragement. Number two, he's going to encourage him through apostleship. There are going to be converts for people in ministry. That's always encouraging. It encourages a pastor when somebody joins the church. It encourages a pastor when somebody uh, finds Jesus as their Savior. Number three, God's going to encourage Paul through fellowship. Fellowship with God himself. We're going to see that in these first 18 verses. God's going to come and fellowship with Paul and encourage him. And fourth, God's going to actually encourage Paul through his enemies. You can be encouraged by your enemies if you recognize your enemies and understand why they are enemies. And we'll see that in the, in the ensuing weeks as we go through this study. I think it's exciting to look at, but first of all, let's look at the companionship. 
God wants to encourage Paul, his downhearted, word, weary servant, and he arrives in a new city, and once again, are any of his fellow workers with him? Well, he's by himself again. And so the Lord's going to encourage him with, uh, with some new companions, and it starts off right about just as soon as we start the chapter. And you know, Paul was really a one in a million kind of guy. He was like one in history. And he, he arrives in a town, and here he comes to town. He comes from Athens. Do they have a big uh, welcome Paul to Corinth parade with a big banner? No. Is there a band playing? No. Nothing. He just walks in, quiet, unannounced, not really knowing anybody, all alone. And you might say, well, why do you really think he's discouraged? Well, I would, I would say to you there's seven reasons, several reasons why I know he's discouraged. When Paul writes back to the Corinthians, you know, he came, he came back to Corinth. Paul comes to Corinth, he leaves Corinth, he comes back to Corinth. And when he writes back, he reflects upon what his attitude was like when he was there. And if you look at 1 Corinthians 2, 3, this is what Paul says. And I think this is indicative of his heart and his feelings and his spirit at that time. He says, I was with you in, and these are words that we often don't associate with the apostle, the apostle Paul. I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. Now, does that sound like Paul? No. I don't, I don't remember reading about Paul shaking a lot. That isn't like him. But that's how he felt. That's the way he felt at that particular time. Maybe he was physically ill. I don't know. But it's obvious he was hurting. And when he writes back to the Corinthians later, he said, you remember when I came? You know, I'm hurting. I was weak. I was fearful. I was shaking. And you know, when he wrote to the Thessalonians, remember he's writing from the city of Corinth. Okay? And when he writes uh, First Thessalonians, it's right as he writes after he arrives in Corinth, okay? And we'll see that as we're going through here. When he, when he writes to them, he says in 1 Thessalonians 3, 7, Therefore, brethren, we are comforted over you in all your affliction and distress by your faith. By your faith. See, what has happened is, when he was in Corinth, Paul gets a word that the church in Thess Thessalonica is growing. He, and he says, I'm concerned. I'm con Encouraged by your faith. I'm comforted in my affliction. He says in our affliction, he's referring to the group in Corinth. We're comforted in our affliction and distress because you, we have learned of your faith. So here are the words that he uses in his self-description of himself as he arrives in the city of Corinth. He uses the words fear, trembling, uh, distress, affliction, all words that spell out that he was hurting that we don't often associate with the Apostle Paul. He's at the bottom of the barrel here. He's, a, he's at the end of his rope. He's discouraged, and nothing has seemed to go like he thought it was going to go or like it should go. Have you ever found yourself in a situation where things aren't going like the way you think they should go? Have you? Yeah. You know, think about what Paul's been through goes to Philippi. Lydia's household gets saved. The jailer gets saved. And then what happens? The whole city run, turns on him and he run, they run him out of town. He gets to Thessalonica. He has a great time in there. Some people get saved. A little church gets started. What happens? They chase him out of there. He goes to Berea. It's a quiet place. Noble people. They believe. They search the scriptures. They get saved. They don't hassle him. But guess what? Here come the Jews from Thessaloniki to hassle them again. He has to get out of that town. They have to hustle them out at night. And he goes to Athens. He's all by himself. He gives a dramatic, dynamic, intellectual offering of, the, of who God is to know the unknown God. And they heard it, and they listened to it, and a few believed. But I think he was discouraged as he left Athens. And he comes to Corinth. He leaves Athens about 40 miles. He goes down to the city of Corinth, and he sees the rottenness of that place. I think it was hard for him to handle initially. It just looked like it might be too much. And 
and it was precisely at that time that God said, you need some friends. And God said, I'm going to comfort you with companionship. And so God brings two people into the life of Paul that he that becomes so beloved to him that he mentions them over and over and over again throughout his whole ministry. Look at verses 1 and 2. <coughs> after these things, after Paul's uh, dissertation at Mars Hill to the uh, Audiophagus, after these things, Paul departed from Athens and he went to Corinth and he found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus. And Pontus is, if you had a map, north of Turkey and south of the Black Sea, okay, present-day Turkey, south of the Black Sea would be Pontus. So this guy, Aquila, is from Pontus, a certain Jew named uh, Aquila, who had recently come from Italy with his wife, Priscilla. Now, it doesn't say if Priscilla is a Jew or a Gentile, but it does continue parenthetically. It says, because Claudius had commanded all Jews to depart from Rome, and he came to them. So here we have Aquila and Priscilla. Now, we've heard, have you heard those names before? Those are famous. Those are very no those are very noted names in the gospel. If you study the word, they're two of the most beloved friends of Paul. And it's, uh, it's interesting just, just to note that Aquila here is mentioned first. But from now on, when they, they are mentioned together, who gets mentioned first? Priscilla. Priscilla, why? It's important. There's a reason. One of two reasons. Uh, she may have been a noble Roman woman. She may have had some stature, or she may have been, a, you know, she may have been like a highbrow society type. So she outranked her husband in that way. Or, as Betsy says, uh, probably I would think the, uh, the, the other and greater possibility is that she became the spiritual. She was the spiritually strong one. And for Paul, that's very, very important. She grew to be spiritually uh, the stronger of the two, and consequently, he mentions her first. Have you ever studied that, Sally? But it's interesting to note that Paul does <laughs> mention her first, uh, either because the reasons I think would be because of heritage or because of her spiritual growth. So they're in Corinth. Why have they come to Corinth? Because they have been kicked out of, in your outline, the word is Rome. They've been kicked out of Rome by the Emperor Claudius. And I'll add a side note here, and this is an opinion, but I'll try to support it. I believe that Aquila and Priscilla were Christians already by the time they met Paul. There's nothing to indicate that they're converted after the meeting of Paul. And the reason I believe that is because they had come from Rome, I believe that there had been an active, viable, vibrant church in Rome long before that. And you might say, well, why do you think that? Well, if you read Romans 1-7, Paul writes, uh, you know, where Paul was when he wrote the book of Romans, he's in Corinth, and when he wrote Romans, he said, to all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints. You see, there's already a church there. They're already called to be saints. And then he continues, grace to you. Peace from God our Father, the Lord Jesus Christ. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. That indicates Paul's in Corinth. There's a very active, vibrant church in the city of Rome, and that is where Aquila and Priscilla come from. So by the time he writes the book of Romans, which is on his second trip into Corinth, the church at Rome has already grown to a place where the faith of those Christians has spread to the known world. And one of the things that have helped to spread that faith, you know, uh, oftentimes uh, we see where persecution does what? Persecution does two things. It promotes, another P word, 
purity. Persecution promotes purity, and it also helps spread the gospel. They kicked all the, the Jews out of Rome. What happened? The gospel spread. Okay? So it gave greater opportunity for the church to speak of Jesus. Now the Gentile Christians, though, the Gentile Christians that were in, John, in, in Rome, they would have stayed in Rome. And that church would have remained in, with the Gentiles who remained there. But the Jews were scattered, and that was part of the reason why the church grew so quickly early in its history. And so it's very likely in your outline that they were Christians, the word is Christians, already. And there's another reason that they, I believe they're Christian. It doesn't say that they, it doesn't say that they got saved. And, and these two people are very, very important. Paul, and it seems to me, if they had been saved upon meeting Paul in Corinth, he would have mentioned it. Because if you go back and see, whenever whenever Paul goes into a city and he, somebody gets saved, does it not list who he got saved? So and so in their whole household, so and so the jailer, this one, that one, this one, that one, and even here in Acts, he'll, later on it'll say it'll say it'll talk about Christmas believing and his whole house and all the way through the New Testament you'll find all these different names of people who are saved in the city of Corinth and there's a lot of them and I'm going to mention all of them as we go through it but Aquila and Priscilla are never mentioned so it would seem to me that they are already saved because if they were saved while, while under his tutelage I certainly think he would have mentioned so later on, Paul will even say, I baptized Gaius, who was Titus Justus, likely, and I baptized Crispus, but he makes no, no mention of Aquila and Priscilla, so I think they're already Christians. And that's just a little footnote. It's what I call historical doodling. <coughs> Do you ever historically doodle? It's for, your, for you to file away in your so when they were in Rome, Aquila and Priscilla and the other Jews, a great persecution broke out against the Jews, and Claudius ships all the Jews out of Rome, and before Claudius did it, the emperor before him, Tiberius, tried to get rid of the Jews. You know how he tried to get rid of them? He sent them to a country that had the plague. <laughs> and he was hoping they would, they would die. And maybe a few of them might come back and give it to the other Jews and they'd all die. That was his solution to the Jewish problem. So uh, you can see that the Jews weren't very popular then, just as they're not that popular today. So following Tiberius, Claudius in 49 AD banished all the Jews from Rome altogether. Every Jew in the city of Rome was to depart the city of Rome. It didn't matter what their belief was, every one of them were supposed to leave. And we know a little bit about Claudius, and the reason we know something about him is about 70 years after that edict, in around 120 AD, there was a man named Suetonius who wrote all about the history of Claudius. Suetonius was a Roman historian, and he got all his information on Claudius and, and put it all together in a volume about his life. And one of the statements that Suetonius makes in the, his book, The Life of Claudius, is this. He says, as the Jews were indulging in constant riots, and then it says this, at the instigation of Crispus, Claudius banded them or banished them from Rome. At the instigation of Crispus. So Claudius unloaded all the Jews because they were rioting all the time. And the riots were instigated by a person named Crestus. Now you can go back and look, and I've tried, you can go back and look in history in that time frame when, when Claudius banned the Jews from Rome, and you cannot find anything in reference to a man named Crestus. But what is interesting as to note, as with it is as it, with, it is with the Greek, it is also with the English. If you change one letter in the name Crestus, you end up with another name, the name Christus, which is the name for Jesus Christ. If you change, uh, if you change.
changed the E in Crestus to an I, Christus, then you have the name for Christ. And it might seem that Claudius, who was writing 70 years after this actual event took place, may have mixed up the name. And what happened when Paul would go into a city, and he would go where always first? He'd go to the synagogue. And what would he do? He would proclaim Jesus Christ. And what would happen afterwards? It would be right. So it might be, I'm not saying this is this isn't the, this is conjecture on my part, but I'm saying that it might be that there was a mistake in this name, and that uh, Claudius got uptight and started kicking the Jews out of town because there were all these riots which were at the instigation of Christus, not Crestus. So Suetonius may have made a mistake in the name because he's writing 70 years later, and it's easy to see how he might have made that simple error. I think they were writing over the issue of Jesus Christ. In your outline, the word is Christ. It seems to me that that kind of issue would preclude the fact that, you know, is the church in Rome presenting Christ? Yes, they are. They're an active uh, first century Christian church. So they're presenting Christ, and they're presenting Christ mainly to their Jewish brothers and sisters. So there's a possibility that the Aquila and Priscilla were already saved at that church and had to leave Rome because of this edict of Claudius. And to give you another interesting footnote, it may have been that Aquila and Priscilla were the ones that excited Paul to go to the church in Rome. Did Paul ever go to the church in Rome? Never made it there. Wanted to go there, and then where did he want to go afterwards? wanted to go to Spain, wanted to pick up supplies and head off into Spain, but he never made it. So that's more intellectual doodling for you. So they arrive over there in Corinth to ply their trade, Aquila and Priscilla, and they're already Christians, it would, it would seem. And so they're introduced in verse 2, and they are so beloved by Paul that he writes about them over and over in his writings in the New Testament. Notice verse 3. So because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked, for by occupation they were skenopoas. They were skenopoas. And skenopoas, uh, skenopoas means they were leather workers. Most people think they were tent makers. Skenopoas are leather workers. Many of them make tents. Paul is a tent maker, but in the Greek, the wording there says he's a leather worker. That's the only time it's used in the New Testament. But that's what Paul did for a living. And, you know, they would take the goat's hair, hair and hide, and uh, they would take the hair and make uh, this product out of it. It comes from a name where Paul grew up, Silicilia, and they would tan the leather, and they would make tents with it, and Paul, Paul was apparently involved in that trade. He would keep the leather and do something with the leather. And they were leather workers, and he was leather workers. And that makes sense because historians tell us that in the synagogues of those times, if they were, uh, most synagogues were segregated according to trades. trades. That word in your outline is trades. So if Paul calls, if Paul comes, goes to the synagogue in Corinth, he's going to sit with the other leather workers. And if Aquila and Priscilla are already in the in the synagogue in Corinth, that's where they're going to be sitting too. So that's how they're going to run into each other. It was common for synagogues to divide people by their trade at that time. And if, if that's true, you know, uh, kind of makes an interesting point. Have you ever thought how your life revolves around other people that you know? Have you ever thought about that? People you meet, the impact they have on your life, the, the things that they, they open your eyes to, just random choices that we make all the time, <clears throat> kind of like where you sit in church. <laughs> I've often thought if, if you 
you get, could get more people to move around in the church, they might find out that there's some other people in the church that they absolutely <laughs> love. <laughs> because they've never met those people because they never sit by those people in the church. I don't know, maybe that's maybe I'm maybe I'm off on that, but if you sit in the same place all the time, you're never gonna meet anybody different. You're only gonna meet the other people that are sitting in the same place with you. So just an idea. But basically, our lives are built around our relationships. The people that we that oftentimes it seems very random how we get to know them, but oftentimes it's very important about who we know. Thus, uh, an illustration of that is Paul sitting with Aquila and Priscilla in the synagogue because they're all leather workers, and that's how he comes to meet them. And they are common; uh, they have that commonality, and they meet. And it doesn't say uh, uh, it doesn't say that he found them out because they were believers of Christ. You know, it just says what does verse three says? He says. Because he was of the same trade, he, what's the word? He stayed with them. My, my, my version says, anybody have a different word? Abode. Abode with them, right. That's the word in your outline, abode or stayed. He moved in with them because they were in the same business. And can you imagine, they meet each other at the synagogue, and they begin to talk to each other. And I don't think, how long do you think it would take Paul to bring up the topic of, are you a Christian? It's not long at all. And maybe if Paul and Priscilla beat him to the punch, but he stays with them and he works with them, or by their occupation, they were then, it says, tent makers. And so he moved right in, and he became a part of their lives. And from that point forward, they become truly if you read the writings of Paul, those two people are mentioned more than anybody else in the life of Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles. All right? Thoughts? Questions? My Bible says that he worked with them, too. Yeah. Stayed with them and worked with them. Yeah. They provided instant they provided, it's almost like God said, I'm going to put you in a position where you're going to get everything you need. He was in Athens. Who did he live with? Probably himself. He goes to Corinth. It's a, it's a pit of a city. And right away the Lord takes him to somebody that he has commonality with. They're saved. They have the same job. He ends up living with them and working with them. The Lord provides exactly what he needs at exactly the right time. Because God's always on time. Sometimes we're slow, but God's never slow. He's always on time. All right? Anybody else? In the synagogue, could men and women sit together? No. Because uh, by this time in their history, they really don't reflect much of anything that they once reflected. <laughs> by this time in history, the synagogue has become so worldly, it reflects. 
reflects the world more than it ever reflected the things of, uh, of God. <coughs> they have, you know, they've, they've turned their back on a lot of their original teachings. It's more important to have an important job because I can rest, you can rest assured that the most important people sat where. You know, I've been to an evangelical church where the front 50 rows are roped up. And you can't get into the front 50 rows if you're not a special person. And that speciality relates to whatever's in your pocketbook or your wallet. Many years ago, the things hardly changed. So that's how the, that's how the synagogue would have been segregated. I'm not sure. I don't know the, the hierarchy of jobs. Uh, like you say, a tanner's probably a kind of stinky dude. So, But there's probably worse jobs. So there's probably some people behind them. But what else? Anybody else?